Hi everyone. It's lovely to see you all here today. My name's Naz and I'm from Alf Insight. Welcome to our brand challenge event. Just to say a little bit about Alf, we are the leading online data and insights platform helping agencies and ad tech specialists to target the leading brands, giving you the key information to help you get in front of marketing decision makers and win more clients. So, good luck everyone that's up today and let the challenge begin. go ladies and gentlemen are we ready for the brown challenge Woo! we had three of these yesterday we've got three more today we're kicking off one from m and uh, then we've got pizza Hut this afternoon and then the challenge of challenges uh, to wrap up the show today so you're in for a real treat um, my name's Jeremy Bassett I run an innovation agency here in London and we sit at the nexus of helping the world's biggest brands connect with the world's most innovative startups here's a 30 second overview of what we do Let's go, all right. So if you're interested in this, and if you're interested in looking at the latest startups, we've got 35 companies here in the House of Innovation that are looking to connect. You can speed date with them, you can meet them at their picnic tables, and of course, you'll bump into them uh, through this session as well. So without any further ado, why don't we get Stuart from m and up here to talk us through the process. We've been on a journey over the last few months. We've uh, taken the brief from m and with uh, scoured the world for innovative startups, and we've uh, selected six of them to present here today. The way this is going to work is we've got one brand challenge, which I'll get Stuart to talk through in a second. We've got six companies that are pitching. Uh, they're going to have three minutes to pitch, and then we've got a, a minute or two for questions. And then there's going to be uh, the announcement of a winner. So Stuart, talk us through. Uh, Obviously, we know about m and but talk us through your role there and, and why you're interested in innovation. Sure. Before I do that, um, just massive kudos to uh, Sarah, Eileen, uh, and Bryony. Uh, amazing. amazing That's cool, wasn't it? It's yeah, really, really cool. Amazing. And, and yeah. really shows what you can do when you put purpose at the heart of something really amazing. So yeah. kudos. And Bryony is also an alumni of m and which also uh, is a okay. nice connection. There we go. Uh, yeah, I head up digital strategy and innovation at m and um, Part of my role um, is a partnerships program, which we've called Ignite. And what that does is connect our business unit teams and our colleagues across the organization with uh, external uh, entrepreneurs and, um, and startup community across the globe. We basically work on a series of briefs, uh, and we become the middlemen for connecting our uh, internal stakeholders uh, with all of the entrepreneurial flair that sits outside across the global startup community. Very cool. So you set the challenge. Talk yeah. us through the brief. Yeah, right. So. Um, this is really coming from uh, the heart of our product uh, engine, which is how do we utilize um, all of the social sentiment uh, and advocacy out in the marketplace to influence commercial value? How do we use that to influence the way that we design and bring product to market? That's really what we're looking for here today. Okay. And when it comes to, obviously, you're going to see six startups, what's the criteria for selecting the winner? Uh, well, it's as much about the people, you know. Um, if you get real confidence in the, uh, in the pitch uh, and the quality of the individuals, of course, we're always looking for that uh, nirvana of something that's easy to implement and that's got high return on investment, of course. Cool, cool, cool. Nothing, nothing to, um, you know, you're, not putting, you're putting the challenge pretty high here, Stuart. Yeah, well, you know. You want low-hanging fruit. Okay, cool. Let's go for this. Why don't you grab a seat and uh, we'll introduce the six startups here. Perfect. Um, the next company is Lead Family. We've got them, right? Yes, come on. Uh, and they're doing some really cool stuff around gamifying the experience. So let's hand it over to Libby.
Hello, everybody. Oh, that's good to know that's working. Hi, Stuart. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Libby. Work for a company called Lead Family. You can find our little picnic table next door if you'd like to come and say hello after this. Uh, I sit within the European headquarters, which is situated in London, but we are actually a Danish company at heart. So take what you will from that with the football last night. We might all be out of a job, um, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. Maybe I can salvage it today. Um, I'm just waiting on my slides to be uploaded. Just got a hand at the back there. Any moment now. But while we're waiting for, for the tech to kind of catch up with us, we can do a little bit of an introduction into the way that we've approached the MS brief today. So our understanding of the pitch, of the brief rather, is how to really be agile and reactive to what MS's consumers want to see in the home and clothing categories right now and make sure that the product offering resonates with this. So while we're still waiting for the tech to catch up with us, what we ask ourselves at Lead Family is how easy would it be in a perfect world if we could just ask our audience what they think? And that's pretty easy for me to say, especially when we consider that 80% of us already feel like companies know way too much about us, and only 15% of us actually feel like we're getting uh, value from granting access to that data. And it's all down to something called the subconscious privacy calculus, which we weigh up in our minds every day. So we're being asked for things like, what's your name? What's your email? Can we track you, sign up to hear more? And all we're thinking is, I don't know if I want to give you all of that for, what is it, 10% off? I don't even know if I want to buy anything from you yet. But with gamification marketing, which is what Lead Family specialize in, it's actually possible to create a scenario in which the user is instantly delivered value from the brand. The, the, uh, the brand actually is able to capture unique insights into participants using a one-to-one -one conversational model. Do we have any update on those slides at the back there? Just one moment. The next slide is quite pivotal because we've got a lovely MS mock-up for you that I really want you to see. So it'll be such a shame if we can't get that going. Yay, here we go. So this is a little bit of an insight into our branding and what we look like. And I'm just going to skip through some of these lovely slides. Nice big brain there. We'll move on to the next one. The statistics that I mentioned here, we hate giving away our data. We don't feel like we're getting good value from it. And this is the subconscious privacy calculus that I just mentioned. So we're being asked for all of this data, and we simply just don't feel like it's worth it in our mind. And what we really want our consumers to feel is that the data that they're giving over to us is worth it. So here we have an MS mock-up of a personality test delivered through Instagram swipe-up stories. Um, obviously, we're looking at the home and clothing categories today, but this could absolutely be a find the perfect home office for you. But what we're actually asking participants to do is go through a series of questions, and based on their answers, we provide them a personality type, and then we funnel them down into a subcategory of product on the website. So we're actually able to gather first-party preference data directly from participants within the game itself. And this is a two-way conversational model. So insight into this data will enable m and to make rapid insights into first-party preference data and be able to introduce hyper-personalization and actually understand product development decisions and wholesale coordination decisions from a better informed basis when they're looking to make sure that the product offering is relevant to the users. And we have an example here from a client, Masai. Um, they actually had over 160,000 people participate in the latest quiz that they ran. And here you can see that nearly 50% of all UK respondents indicated that they don't like their clothes to be too tight. Uh, I myself certainly fall into that category, but they're actually able to make decisions based on what their audience are telling them directly. Can we move on to the next slide? There we go. And in addition to this, we're actually able to maneuver users from social to point of sale in a single activation. So here we can see an instant uplift in return on ad spend from one pound to five pounds to one pound to 30 pounds when the interactive solution is introduced. So gamification actually unlocks the ability to create one-to-one -one relevant personalized messaging at scale. It not only boosts, dramatically boosts engagement rates, but it actually improves the shopping experience that we're instantly delivering our consumers. 
And so, who are Lead Family in relation to all of this? Lead Family is a software company that specializes in gamified marketing. The solution manifests through over 30 pre-coded interactive experiences, such as personality tests, as we've seen today, preferential swipe games, quizzes, polls, video quizzes, advent calendars, it's a long list. And we help our clients introduce these at every stage of the customer life cycle. These can be embedded into apps, embedded into websites, hosted separately as a separate landing page, which we can do, and all of the data flows seamlessly into your systems via an API integration. But we work with our clients on a consultative basis to help them optimize their marketing goals and achieve the campaigns, the dreams that they're looking for. And I think that brings us up to time. It's a speedy three minutes, but I'd be like, delighted if you've got any questions for me. Nicely handled there, Libby. That was great. And no worries. A great demo as well. Definitely worth the slides. Let's jump straight into questions, Stu. Yeah, re re really well done, Libby. Uh, no worries. Yeah, you handled that really well. Uh, and I love, by the way, that subconscious privacy calculus. That's, uh, yeah. that's a really neat spin on things. Um, from a commercial perspective, yes. talk to um, uh, ROAS. Is that the only measure of success that you're pinning this on? No, so the way that we, we're looking at success, it really depends on the client in particular and what they're looking to do with the campaign. As I mentioned, we have 30 different uh, templates, so we typically will use a hybrid of those to achieve what the campaign's looking to do. So really, it depends what the client is seeing as value. Sometimes it can be return on ad spend if it's, we're using it at the very top of the funnel to maneuver people directly from social, um, but seemingly as well, we have a lot of clients who introduce this kind of stuff on a retention basis. So for example, we work with co op in a few different markets, uh, and for them it's a little bit more grocery and food focused, but they're seeing um, a much higher average margin, extra weekly shop, um, and other criteria direct from footfall as a result of games that they're using in-app. So it's really something that can be used across the whole life cycle. Last question, if I may. Um, we've got a really enriched data set because of the Sparks loyalty program that we run. Um, have you got examples of where you've connected with existing loyalty programs to leverage the data that's inside there, but also augment it with the data that you're able to provide? Yeah, absolutely. So because of NDAs, there's some things that we can't go into, but many of our clients already have existing loyalty programs, uh, and typically a lot of those are delivered via app. Um, and the way that we work with them is by using unique user IDs and hosting the games actually within the app themselves. So even though they equally have rich data sets, it's all about how can we have more agility about what our customers want to see now, as in the very present moment, and instantly capture that data and own that and deliver that over into the product offering. Um, but equally, as I mentioned, it can be used to push people down to, to point of sale and, and the revenue aspect is, is often present. Okay. Thanks, Libby. Very cool, thank you, Libby. Yeah. Well done. Thank you very much. All right, so we've got the consumer uh, engaged. We've understood purchase intent. Our next company helps turn purchase or identify purchase intent and turn that uh, into an ad opportunity. So from Fluid Ads, here's Richard. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, Stuart. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, my name is Richard Duxbury. I work for a company called Fluid Ads. Um, you know, we're, we're delighted to be here to pitch to MS and think we've got some fiendishly interesting solutions to the brief. Uh, you'll be really pleased to hear, though, that they are incredibly simple. And after last night's overindulgement, I think we could all do with a bit of simplicity this morning. What Fluid Ads propose to, to, um, to do is target absolutely the right audience that the M&S are looking for. Um, we plan to do this in a, in a number of ways. Uh, we can target through our ad platform the physical stores of m and uh, their competition. We can target online stores, both, both m and and the competition, and you know, app users uh, right across the globe, we can, we can target. Um, why are we doing this? Well, we, we do this to be able to group uh, your consumers based on choice and interest. Once we understand that, it allows you to target them with a, an incredibly bespoke and tailored message and cuts out the dreaded offers and promotions that aren't relevant to me at that point. Um, retargeting in this way uh, allows a really good ROI. It, it allows you to build confidence in, in, in the brand uh, to a more detailed manner. And uh, we're up and running with a number of businesses proving the evidence of, of, of just that.
here we go with the video. Okay, the video isn't playing. It's not the end of the world. Um, you'd have been blown away by it, Stuart, had that played. Um, what it shows you is our technology and how we geofence locations. Um, it was about to show you one of your competition premises in Aintree, and our technology allows us to uh, target um, the people that are in that store uh, and down to the point of when they were in that store. So uh, the example was uh, in the last month, uh, people in that store, and it would collect the ID and. and yeah, you'd, you'd be probably a big round of applause by now if that video had just played. Um, another uh, area of targeting that we specialize in is through the search keywords. So uh, as others do, we, 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 um, we, we follow those people, we track those people based on what they search. And you know, we, we've used the example here of blue, of blue pajamas, and, and, and bear with us on, on why we've chosen that. Um, context is, is, is incredibly important, so we uh, can identify consumers based on the environment that they're searching in, the content that they're reading, and therefore, by logic, if someone was in an environment where they were looking at the top 20 pajama outfits of this year, you know, they're interested in buying some pajamas. Um, our ad platform allows bespoke template design of adverts. So I'm sure m has, a, has a, a very detailed criteria of its, of its creative, but we allow the ability to, to enhance that in our platform so that the, the message that's out there is, is incredibly engaging and interactive. What next? Well, we take that data set, we can add them to your Facebook and Instagram groups to really build a, an incredibly rich and diverse group of, uh, of, of consumers that could potentially buy your products. So in summary, why, why have we done all this? Well, as I mentioned, once we understand the, the, what the consumers are interested in, we can build um, these groups and relate suitable products um, to the right audiences. And of course, you know, this is about money. You know, this is about proactively promoting to, to generate more spend. Um, we also have the ability to, to uh, link up uh, feed ads, so stock-based management systems. The point of that is you would never promote something that was no longer available. Um, the, the final point, which you mentioned in your introduction, Stuart, is, is, is key to this. You know, this understanding of audience based on their, their interests um, and search allows a really quick reaction to, to the trends that are out there. I mean, who saw loungewear in lockdown um, being, being, the, being the big hit? Um, uh, some of the other presentations this morning about nature, you know, recycling of your packaging in homeware may well be something that's of interest to people now that wasn't six months ago. So we can pick up on those trends and allow us to, to target a message that's bespoke uh, based on that. You know, as has been talked about much over the last couple of days, you know, data is incredibly important and can be wasted at the click of a button. You know, what we're trying to do here is identify and engage the MS customers directly. You know, you can tailor a message depending on, 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 on who you are targeting. You know, cross-promoting relevant and suitable products to the, to the people is, is key in all of this. Um, you know, targeting bespoke campaigns based on location you know, is, is, is crucial, I would imagine. You know, so you can, um, taking the entry example, have a, have a bespoke lo local offer there that draws people into a particular store based on an offer or an incentive. Um, but as I say, got to be handled carefully to make sure the messaging remains uh, relevant and, and, and avoids people getting turned off. Apologies, I, I, I wasn't sure whether to get that line in, but we've done it anyway, what the hell. Um, you know, th this is all about, you know, taking an engagement strategy and relating it to social sentiment, ultimately to improve the brand association you've got and, and, and affect the bottom line. That's it, thank you. I've seen the video. I mean, it is block, a blockbuster worthy, I think, Richard. It's, 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 a, it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a 15, but it, it's good. <laughs> We'll have to get a follow-up and get the one in the diary, Richard. Uh, I'd love to see that. Uh, right, the um, two, two things that came to me uh, came to mind immediately. Great commercial angle on it. Um, evidently, you can really see how that can drive commercial value in the short term. How do you qualify for like for mindset and things like convenience over the top of the data sets you're collecting? 
Uh, I mean, we, we, we've run a, a similar campaigns with another other retailers and, and supermarkets. Um, you know, we, we, we track the, the individual. So once we've, we, we've got the individual they're engaged, we don't say job done. We, we, can, we can monitor their interactions in terms of the sales that they go on to do, the, the, the content they engage with. So it, it isn't a, a kind of a, a short term hit. You know, we can we can build an understanding of the data that we've collected on your behalf, and you know, really build a picture of that individual long term. So, they bought some pajamas. Now, have they got some slippers? You know, are they moving house? You know, where, have they moved house? We can really build a, a rich picture of those individuals to, you know, keep them for a lifetime of investment rather than just a one-off hit on one product. Uh, and how do you approach data compliance? Yeah, all, all our partners are, are completely GDPR compliant. We, we ensure that all data sources have, have, have signed up in terms of cookies, etc. cetera. Um, we're, we're about a month away from launching our own cookie-less solution um, to avoid any issues in a couple of years' time, um, which we're really, really pleased about. Um, but yeah, everything's, everything's above board and signed off and, 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 and accredited. Thanks, Richard. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you, Richard. All right, so uh, obviously as we come out of COVID, the next big challenge is how do we get shoppers back into store? The next company is bringing an innovative solution to that. So to explain more, here's Ricardo. Hello. Hi, good morning. Hi, Stuart. Hi, everybody looking at this from home. I'm Ricardo, and I'm the founder of Localistico. We do basically offline retail, so I'm afraid this is going to be the most boring pitch of today. Because we do brick and mortar marketing, which is boring, but very important. Because for most retailers, m and included, 90 plus percent of the revenue is generated on a physical place. As you know, during COVID, there was like a whole emergence of e-commerce. Like everybody's very, very digital now. All consumers are very digital, and we saw that spike on demand on all the e-commerce channels. This is actual revenues over the last months. But what we normally don't see is how that compares to revenue generated on brick and mortar stores, which is that line on yellow on the top. And interestingly, in the US, where people have reopened, that trend of going to the store has actually even gone higher than the previous trend, which means we're going to have a lot of people with disposable income wanting to go back to the stores. We know this because we work with Thara from Inditex Group, and the day that they reopened, there were queues going around the block from people wanting to buy. The interesting thing is that now that consumers are more digital, we should be able to leverage them and target them across all those channels, both offline, which brings, for example, an increased basket. You buy more when you're in a store. But online, when you have discoverability, you have a speed of operations, you can analyze your analytics, which is what all marketers love. You've seen a billion of solutions about analytics. What we think is what happens if we could do both things? Like what happens if you could have the discoverability and the speed of operation and the analytics that you have on digital in offline. Why not do both? And why we don't do both, unfortunately, is like as every brand discovered during COVID, basically the local discovery is different to e-commerce discovery. Like if you think about if I ask you to find actually kids pyjamas is one of my normal queries to show this. If you wanted to show where can I buy kids pyjamas around here, you would start probably with a search that will probably take you either to a page or maybe you get targeted with analytics. You're going to use some apps to request directions to the store. You're going to go to the store where we have people counters and digital POSs and a lot of things that track the user. And then you're going to have an interaction afterwards, maybe leaving me a review if it was really crappy, maybe tagging yourself on Instagram, right? Right now, there is data about you in all those systems. The problem is that there are separate databases. Your first search was maybe in Google Maps. Your traffic in the website is on analytics. Your data from the store is on the people counter or the POS database. Your review maybe is on Instagram. And right now, those are separate databases that are not connected. Not only that, in a large organization like MNS, those databases belong to different teams. If I want to know whether a store is open or not, I need to talk with store operations. If we are running a campaign, that's with digital marketing. If I need to change anything on the website, I need to speak with e-commerce. And this is why, for example, during COVID, a lot of your store locators were not updated, and basically you didn't know if a store was open or not, so you couldn't transact, right? Imagine if we could put all of that together. So that's basically what we do at Localistico. Localistico is basically a SaaS platform which tries to do inbound marketing automation, but for physical stores. 
What we try to do is use all those channels to help people find you and drive more footfall, optimize how many people are going to the store, track and analyze everything that they are doing in any of those channels, how many people search for you, how many people ask for directions, how many people bought on a given store, and then help you launch posts and promotions around those stores to kind of drive even more people on the store. And basically, we try to put together all those channels in a simple, simple way, even something that you can share with the whole organization. Like some of our clients, every shop manager and every area manager has got access to their own data, for example, and can launch their own promotions. And then you can do, of course, funnel views and all these things, but orientated to stores. How many people are searching on an area? How many people are clicking through my store? How many transactions did we actually make? And for any retailer on the shop, if we cannot increase your top line in like 10% and your bottom line in around 5%, I'm eating my shoe. So, and of course, you can share that with the rest of the organization, which is another important thing. Drive more people to the store, but also make an organization more efficient, which is something that's going to be another topic. What, how do we use the stores and how do we use the store's personnel? Uh, Localistico is like a very funny name and very difficult to pronounce, so you may not know our brand, but we work with some of the largest retailers in the world, including Inditex and Morrisons, for example, both very related to what m and does. And basically what we're trying to do is that, how can we make offline retail take some of that speed of digital and put it in practice? And we think this is going to be very needed over the next years. That's basically everything. Thank you. Yeah, like, it's, it's super interesting. I'm not sure it was against the specific brief around, uh, around social sentiment, but actually answers a question that you know, incumbent, not legacy, incumbent retailers like ourselves are facing into. Um, and so by kind of a, a weird perverse twist of, uh, of fate, I, that's a really interesting solution and one that has got great tangibility for a business like ours. Thank you. Um, well, how, how do you drive out um, kind of the incremental value of each of the touch points in order to drive the investment uh, going forward for each of those brands? Yeah, so we normally take every project like customizing to what the retailer is trying to do in the short term. The first thing would be, of course, driving more people to the store because we think if we make it a revenue earning project is more important than an analytics one. So we try to, for example, m is a destination target, what we call, so you sell everything from like food to clothing to anything else. So it would be of which of those categories people that are searching right now are not finding those categories and which ones do we have to promote? That's normally the main, main one. And for that, we analyze competitor traffic in the area, each of the stores, because for example, you're not going to promote the same an m and food as you promote a traditional big one where you have both food and, and tailoring. So we try to actually do that, combine, analyze the case, look first at how we increase funnel, and then look at the analytics to the side. Thank you. Uh, and kind of implementation, uh, what's the sort of lead time you're talking about before you can start to see first returns? So we launched, for example, O2 UK, very famous telco. They have 500 shops. We launched them in a week. So we basically can get somebody running a B2B SaaS platform, so it's very easy to implement. We can get the beginning running in the first month, and then from then, obviously, it's analyze and evolve, like you do in marketing, typically. Any central integrations required, or is it all kind of off-platform? Sorry? Any central integrations required with the retail partners, or are you taking all external data? Yes, if we do offline integrations, it can be direct, so if you work with somebody like Oracle Micros or anything like that, or it can be indirect, be if you're already connected to a SAP or a Salesforce or a Microsoft Dynamics, we can connect to those. Thank you. Very cool. Sure. Thank well you. Done. Thanks, Ricardo. So that's three down, three to go. Uh, and our next company is looking at how, you can, how can you turn audiences into participants. So from StageCast, here's Dennis. Hello, yep, it's on. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dennis and I'm part of the management uh, team at StageCast. And I'm here to tell you how StageCast can turn social buzz into commercial value through engagement campaigns. StageCast is um, an audience engagement uh, platform that helps drive brand activation, audience engagement, or community building for marketers, brands, and rights holders. We have multiple activities on our platform, such as quizzes and polls and and uh, many more, and they are all very brandable. They work on all channels, and they help measure marketing success, and they can even help retain and monetize audiences. In detail, you pick an activity on our online builder, 
you fill it with your content, you customize it according to your brand, and you can even add prizes and giveaways. You get a link that can be shared in every single channel that you prefer. It could be a QR code, it could be embedded into apps. The platform then delivers a bunch of metrics that helps you measure the engagement that could also be downloaded through reports on our online builder. Finally, you can add call to action pop-ups that can help you direct your customers to whatever driven value. So if that is to gain followers, or if it's to link to a shop, or collect email addresses to a newsletter, that could be all driven through the call to action pop-ups. So how could this look for, for MS? When MS wants to collect or react to a social buzz, you can, we can help you set up um, audience engagement campaigns. And all of these campaigns and activities can include multiple activities throughout uh, a period of time. And it could also be linked to a loyalty program. This could also then be shared in all your channels. It could be uh, through a QR code in your store, or it could be uh, collected to your social channels. All of these kind of activities can also be, uh, the participants can claim a prize through participation, and you can even add votings and polls to get more customer data around preferences. And to showcase how easy it is to translate social buses into different uh, MS activities, we uh, went ahead and created one Equality Month campaign, and we also went, uh, went ahead and created a Pride Month campaign. So this is how Stagecast is turning social bus into commercial value. We take consumer opinions and trends, we turn them into interactive gamification uh, campaigns, and then we can, as a result, increase traffic to your preferred channels, we help qualify business leads, and ultimately, you can give you metrics to support product development and go-to-market strategies. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, it's super interesting, actually. Um, probably closest to the brief, I would say. Um, although I, I get the sense that we're kind of manufacturing the social sentiment rather than kind of listening to what's naturally out there. Um, and so I'd like to understand a bit more about that. Um, our product life cycles run for you know, between six and 12 months. How do you feel that we can utilize this data to influence the production of our end-to-end -end kind of product engine? Yeah, it's still on. Uh, so if I understood the, the, the question correctly, if you have your customers sort of uh, interacting with the social bus to collect what preferences they want in products, uh, for example, if it's a sustainability initiative, you can kind of help uh, gathering data if that is actually something that they want to see more in your stores or online. So you can, uh, the metadata that comes from our platform can then help you to make decisions in terms of which uh, kind of product line you want to. Do you have any examples of where some of your partners have done that and, and delivered product that's, that's been a success? Uh, in terms of product, uh, we haven't had too much of that as of yet, uh, but uh, we are seeing more requests coming in on uh, sort of brands wanting to use us more in, in driving product development and go-to-market. Who are you working with right now? Uh, so uh, that is not kind of uh, related to M&S, but we have been working with Mercedes-Benz, for example, in, uh, in their uh, new launched car. Uh, we have also worked with Oriflame Cosmetics uh, and yeah, other kind of major, major brands as well. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Dennis. All right, our next company is looking at how can you reward uh, uh, users for engaging with their brands. So from Swayze, here's Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Yeah, oh, okay, hello. <laughs> well, I'm Leslie Salazar. I'm a woman with swagger and gray, so that's what my CEO believes. And I am here to introduce you to uh, the app of Swayze. 
This is an app, this is a social gaming platform app where we want to reward users by being users, by being fans, and by creating tailored games. We live in a world where we're, looking, we're all the time looking for some type of engagement. We like likes, sharing, commenting, reviews. But we just thought, like, why don't we do something that is more for the customer? We know how people interact with brands by, by, um, by doing tailor games. So Swayze, um, we want to get some customer interaction by creating tailor games and uh, get these um, this, this people to get rewarded by Swayze. So Swayze are token. Tokens, yes, and these are crypto coins that they can be interchanged inside the marketplace that we've done or with the same brand. For example, it would be with you, with Max Spencer's. So obviously it's for a tech savvy type of audience. And this is, we have an amazing, super long <laughs> pitch for you that we can send for you. Oops. There. So as keywords, I would like to say that we have tailor games and brands. So when we say tailor games, for us, we want to say that we want to, you have the insight of what is your customer or your ideal customer, and we can make games. So let's get engaged, let's get married, and let's get something that we can do and we can make your customers play in a different way. Because obviously, uh, when you go to Instagram, Facebook, and all this stuff, you have your own communities, and they're great, they're awesome. But sometimes it's a little bit limited, and sometimes people can get a little bit bored. So you either can do your own community, you can use Python and you can do, you know, all these things and do your own community, or maybe you can do something fun for them and do something that is unique. So people will get there and they will say like, oh my God, I'm going to play the new um, coconut milk from Mark Spencer's, for example, and you can do something like that. And another keyword that I said is brands. So we've created an environment where obviously you will be there with other brands and you might be thinking, mm, I don't like that. I don't like being with Morrison's, but um, if you, well, if that's what we think. Customers, they evolutionate in a, in, a, in a very extensive way. Like for example, I use Ribber, but I also like Nike. So when I go to Foot Locker, for example, I do love Reebok, but if I really like a really good pair of Nike shoes, I would buy Nike. So the good thing of being in a nice environment where there's other brands, you can engage with other customers. Because some customers might go sometimes to Mark Spencer's, they can go to Morrison, Tesco's, stuff like that. So it's a way of interacting with different type of customers. So we think this could be really good. So this is the explication of everything that I said that I just talk really quickly, <laughs> sorry. So as you can see, Swiss is a blockchain-based social engagement platform where users gain rewards for engaging with brands. So this is the main thing, connecting brands with customers, but in a fun way. And obviously what we want to give them is real world rewards. So obviously we know that sometimes this word of crypto and this word of coins can be a little bit challenging for some people, but we can make it real. So they will get rewards not only inside the marketplace, but we can exchange that in, for example, in your store. Like they can have QR codes, they can say, oh, you know, I played this game and I won, I don't know how many canes, I can, you know, you can scan it and you can exchange it for, I don't know how many coconut milk, as you can see, I love coconut. <laughs> so that's the thing that I'm saying. So mainly is that we want to elevate engagement in another type of way. And we want to mobilize audiences. So we also, as we are so cool, swagger and new, we also have something else. So we're not stopping only in the games. We've also created an NFT artist club. So in the NFT artist club, we are going to let anybody that has digital capacity to create artist pieces to come inside and submit the art pieces. And then if they're good enough, if they're selected, they will become part of that member club. Obviously brands will be able to check all these art pieces and here is where you get your commercial value. Because obviously all these people that will come with their following and they will come with their, with, with their people and their staff from other social media platforms. 
Okay, and when they submit these assets, people get crazy, you know, like for example, I'm not sure like sometimes you can see people, they doing the hair, the Nike stuff, the stuff, so this is getting translated into the digital world. So you as Marcus Spencer's, for example, can see somebody and say like, oh my God, I really like this piece. Could we use it in social media? So this will be cost effective for you because people will get super excited to be working for you. You can be working with new artists and obviously it will be a win-win. Leslie, we've got like 30 seconds left. Oh, I want to leave time to. Uh, she says, We are the best. We're so cool. We just launched <laughs> a new game for you. And this is, the, this is the thing. And we're the best. There it is. Although right. the other ones are really cool too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so here you have all the stuff of boating, location, AR. You know, we have all the type of pools and all the stuff that we. We just want people to have fun and not just to be, you know, just like normal stuff. So thank you very much. There it is. Boom. Well done. Thank you. Let's do one quick question. One question. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, oh, the question is, is the opportunity for us to be part of your platform? Yeah. You know, what you're selling us? Yeah. Um, and how do you think that would connect to the existing kind of core demographic of Marks and Spencers? Sorry? How do you think that connects to the existing core demographic of Marks and Spencers? Well, because we're going to be creating, we have all the designers and we're going to be creating a tailored game that is only yours and it's going to be unique. So I think that's great. You're going to have like your own game for anything that you want. It can be, I don't know, you have like all the clothes, like food, anything. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Leslie. All right, I, for our final pitch, we've got, uh, we're going to go back to InstaPanel. Uh, they're joining us virtually uh, because of COVID, they can't be here physically. So we're going to roll the video for InstaPanel. Hi, my name is David Khan, and I'm the founder and CEO of InstaPanel. So InstaPanel is a market research partner that lets you go beyond traditional social listening tools that passively listen to chatter on social media to actually actively engage with the participants on social media. So we can go out and recruit highly targeted audiences from social media to record video responses to your open-ended questions. So there's a lot of potential uh, uses for that. So you know, standard use is uh, mobile ethnography. So we can ask people for their perceptions about a product or category. There's also, we can do creative validation where we actually put, you know, add images, copy, video, even a full website in front of panelists and, and get their responses to that. And then we can go to customer journeys where we actually have people do things in the real world. They could go to a store and record their experience. They could do an unboxing of something that we've sent them, or they could even get, use a product for, for several weeks even and give you their, their kind of long-term feedback on, on that product. So there's a lot of potential uses for that. So I'm gonna show you our platform. So this is the interactive infographic that you would get with every project. We can also, we also, our standard is to deliver a top line findings report that highlights key themes and interesting quotes that emerged from the, from the research. So in this case, we were helping a sustainable, sustainably focused fashion startup that had a concept for a bracelet that basically could turn into a tote bag. So you never had kind of forget your, your bag when you're at the shop. And uh, so the first phase was a bit more of an ethnography, understanding people's um, you know, perceptions and of, of sustainability, you know, problems around bag usage, single use plastics, things like that. So for this, we did a combined video quant sample. So we record, uh, recruited uh, about 20 uh, video participants and then about 200, 210 quant responses. So everybody answered the same multiple choice questions. And then the video respondents also answered additional questions. So that kind of gives us statistical rigor. We'll also give you deeper insights from the video respondents. So you can see the, the, the video panelists. We can see a demographic distribution. So, you know, pretty gender balanced. I think we tended to, the client wanted us to skew a little bit younger for this project. You know, income, suburban, urban, rural distribution. And, you know, we can get much more specific in terms of demographics if you, if you need that. So this is a uh, multiple choice question, which the following causes, if any, do you care about? Uh, so I'll apply. Um, so, you know, pretty standard. Where it starts to get interesting is question four. What are your thoughts on the sustainability movement? So for this question, this is a video question, and the, the words in the word cloud come from the panelists actually responding on video, and then our team sociologically coding the concepts that are being expressed. 
And most things in this results are clickable. So if I click on single-use plastic, it'll split the results into those on the left who mentioned single-use plastics and then those on the right who didn't. And then I can just click in and, and view a video. So let's see what Emma was saying about single-use plastics. I think the sustainability movement is really important. Some of the things that come to mind when thinking about that is places that have reduced the use of plastic bags and stores that have you bring your own bags and thinking about single use plastic, I would So as you can see, you got the video on the left, transcript on the right, sociological codes below. And like I said, we'll also author a uh, top line findings report for any projects that we run for you. So for, you know, on, on your team, you know, you may have expertise in market research or you may not. We can work with you either way. So, you know, you understand your research objectives better than we do. We understand our platform better than you and we meet somewhere in the middle. So we're happy to help as much or as little as you'd like with the methodology, crafting the questionnaires and uh, analyzing the results. So really it's kind of a tech platform plus you get our team behind you to actually help execute these projects quickly and efficiently. So thanks for your time. Appreciate it. There we go. Yeah, give them a clap. They're watching virtually, so they can hear that. All right. There we go, Stu. Six companies from our House of Innovation. Why don't we give you a minute to go away, have a think, and then we'll come back and um, announce the winner. Thank you. Let's do this. Here we go. We've got the shiny cup. Look at that. So, Stu, talk us through um, from the, the companies you met here today. I'd love to get your thoughts. We started off with Lead Panel, uh, Lead Family. What were your thoughts on... Lead family. Yeah, I mean, let's rotate my screen. Uh, yeah, I think uh, on lead family, uh, potentially, possibly more of a challenge to engage uh, our demographic of customer through gamification. Um, we've not really had success in that space before, but I uh, would love to have a follow up and see how that could work, particularly about how we can create value over and above the Sparks proposition. Yeah. Uh, so I think I thought it was really interesting and great uh, presentation from Libya as well with all the tech challenges. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> kudos to her. And then we had fluid ads. Yeah, I think, again, great relevance here. I think there's a real commercially-led opportunity here that we'd like to follow up on. Um, yeah. I can certainly see how that can drive value uh, for, for our business. I mean, real probably tangible commercial value, which I like. Again, didn't really answer the brief specifically, but I see how it relates to our operation. Yeah, yeah. and then we had Localisto. Yeah, I mean, that's the most off-topic. I think that um, that's like a, a rogue brief, but actually is the one that I can see us driving most commercial value with. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of red herring, if you like. Um, really good proven products, lots of great companies they're working with. So again, um, definitely worth a follow-up for sure. Um, yeah. And then we jumped into Stagecast and their idea of turning audiences into participants. Yeah, on Stagecast, uh, I think the challenge for us, again, is how we integrate that with our Sparks data platform. Um, it's a really rich data set that we've got, and so uh, being able to leverage and augment that in different ways is something we're, re we're really interested in doing. So, uh, again, uh, no doubt, really innovative solution and, and probably well worth a follow-up in some detail as well. Cool, and then we had Swayce and their idea of creating games for I mean, Yeah, I love it. I just think that's so far-fetched for, uh, for where we're at right now, but um, probably the most innovative solution of all the presentations that we saw today. Uh, super interesting. Uh, I'm not sure our demographic is ready for blockchain and NFTs just yet. However, uh, we've got to prepare ourselves for the future, right? Uh, and that's what this is all about. <laughs> Liz, Leslie, Getting not a good idea from Leslie. Uh, yeah, but super, super innovative. Yeah, really, really creative. So uh, it's a great product. And then we finish with Instapanel and their approach to social listening. And yeah, the thing I worry about there is this kind of concept of reality versus sentiment. Like if you're asking people to opt into certain things, like how honest are they going to be? Um, and so I've got um, I know, a bit of hesitation around how we can qualify um, the, the, the reality of the situation with the, the quality of the individuals that, that are on the panel. But um, again, I can see how um, leveraging real-time sentiment can, can, can drive commercial value for us. So um, I think they're uh, a maybe follow-up for me. Cool. Very cool. But of course, there can only be one winner. So the winner of the M&S brand challenge is? Yeah, it's the red herring, I'm afraid. It's Localisto for okay. me. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. This is yours. Thank you. Very good.